Welcome to another RD Works Learning Lab. I'm very chilled today, look, sitting out in the sunshine outside my workshop. For a good reason. I've borrowed one of my wife's monocles and I want to show you when you take a large laser beam and you pass it through a large lens, in other words, you make the laser beam as big as you can, you get a very well focused small spot of light. Up there in the sky today we've got a bright white object which is firing non-coherent parallel rays of light at this lens. So let's just see what we can do with this lens. Now I've got to get this lens roughly in the plane of the Sun and there it is. Look, you can see the Sun right in the center of the lens now and if we focus it down and look how little movement there is on this lens to get it to go in and out of focus. And I can focus that sun down to a very very small spot just there and the spot is roughly what three millimeters diameter on that piece of paper. That's the size of the sun when I get it nicely focused. And that's the property of a lens to focus light to a very small accurate focal point. And we saw a three millimeter sun on my paper. I want to show you some other interesting facts about this lens when I start playing with the diameter of light that passes through this lens. But although I've got this lens covered over, it's these parts here which are focusing the sunlight down to the focal point of the lens. There, and then I start moving away again. Okay, so I've got a, a focal diameter there of about maybe four or five millimetres diameter. What I'm going to do now, I'm going to block off all except a little hole in the middle, three millimetres diameter. And that's at the axis of the lens. Now look, you can see how close I am to the paper. I'm not really projecting any sort of a focal point onto there. What I'm doing, I've actually got the, uh, that hole is actually obscuring the sun and what we're letting through is just parallel rays of light through the centre. We've certainly got no focus there at all. It's, the focus has disappeared. Which is interesting, isn't it? Because, hey, lenses, lenses are supposed to focus. So let's just take that very small hole out and put a slightly bigger hole in. Can we make that focus? Oh, look, it's gone out of focus. It's all fuzzy because we're here at uh, something like about two foot now. So we can bring it into focus there lovely crisp but is it changing its size? No, not really it's getting, you know, I'm right up close against it now and all we're getting is the projection of the light through the hole. Just try and get it at 90 degrees to the Sun. There we go. So we're getting smaller we're getting a sort of a focus and right in the center I think there might be a little teeny weeny spot of light there and now we're out, we're through the focus and we're out the other side but you'll see how little focus we've actually got these rays are hardly we're hardly changing the diameter of the beam at all it's remaining pretty constant even though it's going in to focus just maybe there we're not getting any serious change in the beam diameter. We're looking at uniform light coming from the Sun here. Everything is nice and uniform. With a laser beam that's not the case. I want you to take the observations that we made during that experiment into this session but it's not probably very clearly understood how that property has a serious effect on lasers and lenses. Now we're back in the office because there are several things I want to show you on the screen and I've got quite a few diagrams I want to talk about but we will eventually go into the workshop. This diagram here is what you've just seen with that lens. We've got uniform rays of light coming in from the Sun hitting the curved face of my lens and focusing down to a point. That's exactly what you understand lens theory to be about Lens theory has been around for thousands of years, the ancient Greeks, 
the Egyptians, the Romans, the Middle Ages, right up to date. We've got wonderful computer programs that design lenses and lens systems for us to do all sorts of things. Now, I came to disbelieve in lens theory when I found that lenses were not doing what I expected them to do when I put a laser beam through them. It's not unreasonable to assume that people like Copernicus, uh, Kepler, Galileo, Da Vinci would not know anything different than this because we're using laser light to damage materials. Laser light has got special properties and those special properties act with a lens in a completely different way that lens theory predicts. The essence remains the same because, hey, look, this is a light ray and the laser beam is made up of light rays. So it's the same material that's passing through these lenses, light. OK, a bit of an oxymoron here. It's invisible light. As the uniform rays conglomerate together, they become more and more intense. And I've just demonstrated to you that with the way that I can concentrate sunlight by focusing the beam a certain distance away from the lens. These rays are coming in and they're hitting this curved surface here or this sloping surface. And the greater the slope of that surface, the more the ray will change direction. And it hits another surface here and changes direction again. So there are two what they call refractions that take place as light passes through a lens. But note that this angle here and the amount of distortion and bending that's taking place here is different to the amount of distortion and bending that's taking place here. And the reason for that is very simple. Look at the angle here that these rays are hitting the surface at. And look at the angle at which the rays are hitting the surface at just here. There is no angle. This face is absolutely at 90 degrees to the ray that hits it it means there will be no refraction taking place along that center line there. And because there's no refraction, there is no concentration of the light at the center of a lens. So it doesn't focus the light right on the axis of a lens. When we used the whole of the lens, you could see that I only had to move this lens by a very, very small amount and I could get this to focus or not focus, not focus, focus. But when I cut down the lens, A to a very, very small hole, what's the diameter change of the light that's passing through that lens? Look, there is no focusing taking place on that thick line there. Look, it's passing straight through the middle of the system with no effect. And when I start moving out just a little bit, as I did with my second hole, we're still getting virtually no focusing effect. It's only as we get further out from the centre of the lens and we get more curvature that we get this focusing effect. Now all the lenses that you're likely to come across are what they call spherical geometry. This is part of a sphere. Every lens, no matter what its shape, has got this central piece just here. Now what happens is as a lens becomes longer in its focal length, it becomes less curved. So the less curvature there is on this shape, the longer the focal length. But hang about, the less curvature we've got means we've got more flatness at the center of the lens because this flattish section here becomes even wider as the lens becomes flatter. That's an interesting property that I didn't originally understand about lenses until I started working with my RF machine. We're going to come back onto our, my RF machine because that's where I first discovered, to my disappointment, that the centre of a lens doesn't do anything. Let's go and have a look at the beam that comes out of my RF source. Now, RF laser beam technology is exactly the same as the glass tube technology in that it produces a CO2 laser beam at 10.6 microns wavelength. The, the difference is the way in which that laser beam is created. 
With a glass tube, it uses very high voltage to produce the laser effect. But with an RF tube, it uses very high radio frequency, which is what RF stands for, to produce the laser beam. It's the same laser beam with exactly the same gases and everything inside this tube. It's just done by a different manner. So my glass tube is 70 watts, five or six millimeters diameter, and this is 30 watts with a three millimeter diameter. Now the problem with an RF tube is this, something called beam divergence, and it's got a specification which says eight millirads. Well, in very simple terms, what that means is it's eight millimeters growth in the beam per meter. So let's just take a look at what that means for my RF source on my Tangerine Tiger. It starts off here, I've got 100 millimetres, then I've got 400, 600, all the way up to 1200 millimetres at this point here. We're 1.3 metres away from the source, so 1.3 metres times 8 gives me 10.4 millimetres of growth over that 1.3 metres. Plus the 3, meter, plus the three millimetres that I started with just here means that at this point here, my beam is now 13.4 millimetres diameter, not three. That's a huge change in the beam diameter. So you're going to ask the question, what's the problem? Well, look, I've already demonstrated the problem to you with my white light example this morning. When we had a big beam passing through that big lens, it was able to do a huge amount of magnification, concentration of light, down to a very small focal point. When we had a small beam, not as much light passing through the hole, but more importantly, it was not really able to focus. With that excuse alone, we should understand that a big beam produces a much better focusing effect than a small beam. We'll look at the same information in a slightly different way. Here's my laser source and I'm going to fire my laser beam out at mirror one, mirror two and mirror three and down to the lens. I've got my lens burning a spot or a mark right over at the back left hand corner of the machine. This is the closest I can ever get to this laser source and I'm going to call that dead beam because I can't use that part of the beam when I start moving around the table. So that beam length there is typically 400 millimeters by the time it gets to this point here and then what I've done I've shown you the other corners of the machine with the dimensions the length of the beam that it takes to reach these points for example to get from there to there when I've got a 300 millimeter y-axis I'm going to have that 400 plus another 300 which is 700 millimeters to reach there half of that is 150 half of that is 250 which is 400 plus the 400 that we started with means the middle of the table is 800 and so on. So that's how I got to these numbers and how those numbers relate to this diagram here and this diagram here and this diagram here. So if I want a uniform performance across the whole of my table between 400 and 1200, this is not going to cut it because it's going to change the diameter. The diameter of the beam is going to change between here and here. And that means I'm going to get change of cutting performance or change of engraving performance, but particularly cutting performance. To make sure that we don't get this divergence across here, standard lens theory says that if you can grab hold of this three millimeter beam, put it through something called a beam expander and make it bigger. And let's just say that this is times three here is the beam expander. We've now increased the beam from three to nine millimeters. But the good news is it's nine millimeters right the way across the machine. Maybe it's not quite perfect. Maybe it's 10 millimeters here because these don't work absolutely perfectly. So you can say, well, that's wonderful because now we've got uniform performance across the machine. Let me just quickly say to you here, and this is the point that really annoys many lens theory advocates, I'm going to be changing a perfectly good high intensity three millimeter beam to a much lower intensity nine millimeter beam. That three millimeter beam is absolutely fantastic for cutting. Decrease it, increase it to nine millimeters and you've just 
castrated the cutting ability of this machine and turned it into a, an engraving machine that will cut inefficiently. But I'm going to prove that beyond any shadow of doubt today by the, get, by the time we get to the end of this session. Understanding this problem, I was trying to keep my beam as small and as straight as possible. But my times two beam expander probably started off at about six millimetres here, but by the time it got to the end of the table dimension, roughly here at 12 or 1300 millimetres, I was getting a beam that was around about seven or eight millimetres diameter. You're going to say, well, what's the problem with that? The laser beam itself is a strange animal. It's something that the ancient Greeks, the Egyptians, Galileo, Newton, anybody that's been involved with light had no concept of. And that was the concept of coherent light. Now, the idea of coherent light and laser beams is a bit of a strange one. Light is totally random and it's here all the time around you. And let me try and give you an analogy. Light photons, these things that are here, bits of energy that are completely invisible to you until they hit something, those photons are like raindrops. Raindrops in themselves are not dangerous. You're living in a world of photons all the time. You're happy with raindrops. But if you collect those raindrops together into a river and then put them together yet again and turn them into a tsunami, what you've got is all those raindrops operating together. They're operating in unison. Would you want to stand in front of a tsunami? Well, that's exactly what a laser beam is. The photons have been purposely organized so that they're fully synchronized almost into an army. And they are very, very powerful. They're not random anymore. They're not uniform beams of light. If you take a cross section across a laser beam, and look at the brightness or the intensity of the light within the laser beam, you'll see that it follows this sort of graphical representation where there's the width of your beam and there's the intensity of the light inside the beam. Okay, you can see that the light is most intense right at the center of the beam and there's virtually no light at the, at the edge of the beam. Material damage happens because of intensity. So the greater that we can make the intensity in a laser beam, the more damage we can do. And one of the ways of making the intensity increase in a laser beam is to put it through a lens. Because what does a lens do? It collects all the light together into a single focal point. And that's the argument people make when they say increasing the diameter of the beam is going to have no effect really because by the time we put it through a lens we can make it intense again. So just because we've lost the intensity that we had up here it's unimportant. I'm afraid that logic doesn't quite work because this is a get what they call a Gaussian distribution. Other people would know it's a bell curve, it's a normal distribution but it's the particular distribution for a laser beam. And the quality of a laser beam is judged by the, its ability to match the shape of this curve. Glass tubes are, for instance, 1.1, which is about 90 something percent match to this. RF tubes are about 1.2, which means they're not quite as accurately matched to this, but they're still very similar shape to this. This shape here has got some rather interesting properties. I'm gonna draw a square on here, which is 10 by 10. So the area in that square is 100. If I change the base to one, but keep the area the same, the height has got to be 100. The same thing happens here with a Gaussian distribution curve. So we've got 60 watts of area under that curve for a six millimeter diameter beam. In the same way that we change our 10 by 10 square into 100 tall by one at the bottom, so the same has got to happen to here. So if we change our beam from six millimeters to three millimeters, look what we've done to the intensity. So we squashed the beam size down and we've increased the intensity in the beam size. Intensity equals rate of doing damage to your material. The greater the intensity, the faster you can damage material. What do we want to do for cutting? 
we want to damage the material quickly to get through to the other side. So if we increase the beam size, as we do here at the bottom, and we make it nine millimeters diameter instead of three millimeters diameter, you could say that I've just decreased the ability of this tube to cut. It's now become blunt as opposed to sharp. So an RF machine, by the time you do this to it, you've got a great engraving machine that will cut, but not very well. And the strategy for my Tangerine Tiger was recognizing that I'd got a very super small, high intensity beam coming out of this 30 watt RF tube, as opposed to a beam like this, which comes out of my 70 watt glass tube. Look at the difference. This has already got a head start and this would be my equivalent glass tube, 30 watts. But of course, my glass tube has got 60 watts, so it will have a shape which is up here somewhere because I've got to get twice as much area on that beam width. So it'll chase it, it'll, it'll cause it to come up here somewhere like this. It won't get as high intensity as that, but it will be up here and be a reasonably good cutting beam. And I know it is a good cutting beam because you know, you've seen me using the machine. And that's why I've spent quite a lot of time over several sessions in the last six months trying to develop this thing here, which I is not a beam expander. It's something which I'm calling a beam conditioner because I'm not attempting to produce a nine millimeter diameter beam. I'm trying to keep a three millimeter beam at the center my work table. I've got my special beam conditioning set of lenses in here and those lenses start off by producing I don't know maybe a six millimeter eight millimeter diameter beam as it comes out of here but then what it does it very nearly as parallel like this but it comes down to a focal point here. Now this is an intensity focal point that produces the most amount of damage but using all the data of what's inside this unit here. It's been calculated that the optical focal point is at about 700 millimeters. Whereas I'm going to show you that the real damage focal point is here at 800 millimeters, 100 millimeters different. Now that already calls into question how well lens theory can do the calculations associated with the damage that I'm seeing. Lens theory works on the basis that all rays are the same intensity. Whereas I've just shown you on the Gaussian distribution that the rays that pass down the center of this beam are much more intense than the rays that are on the outside of this beam. So this is what my conditioner finished up producing. This was the raw beam as it came out of the tube. And here's what I finished up at 800 millimeters, 1000 millimeters and 1200 millimeters, 600 and 400. And at 400 millimeters we've got a, a slightly blunter beam. And according to everything that I've found and discovered by observation, this is great at cutting and this is not great at cutting. Still the same amount of power contained in that beam as there is in that beam but it's distributed differently. This very high intensity part here is so close to the axis of the lens that when you get a flat long focal length lens, the flat section at the center of the, at, at the central axis of the lens is producing almost zero refraction. And this beam passes right through the lens like that. And if I test that on the other side of the lens, I should be able to get almost exactly the same mode burn back to this diagram. And this time I'm going to change it slightly. We're now going to superimpose our Gaussian intensity distribution on these rays. And I'm going to ask you the silly question. Look, these rays here from the outside, which you saw were very, very powerful when it came to collecting the light from the sun, even though I had big chunks missing out the middle here, we're still focusing the light down very intensely. But hang on, these rays, they're non-existent because look, the intensity of light here are not really doing much focusing at all out here because there's nothing to focus. And let's go right to this maximum intensity, 
where we're going to be able to do the most amount of damage, remember, with our high intensity. And what we want to do is we'd like to focus that very high intensity by putting it through the centre of the lens. But hang about. What did I tell you about the centre of the lens here? It's got no focusing effect. So whatever that intensity is, it's going to pass right through the centre of that lens. It's only this intensity down here, this mid-range intensity if you like, that's having some sort of focusing effect. So I'm going to take my 3mm beam and I'm going to open it out to a 9mm base. And as I open it out and make it a 9mm beam, look what I'm doing to the intensity. The intensity is dropped off. This low intensity section which passes right through the centre of the lens and does cutting damage is going to really not be very effective at all. So as we move out two or three millimetres from the centre we've got this mid-range intensity which will be focused so that it can be turned into a very small spot diameter. Just like our big lens that I showed you earlier in the video. This out here, look, it's so low it's going to have no effect at all. Right? So the key part of this is going to be somewhere here. So I'm again using the compound lens that I use for engraving the fox. Um, very very short focal length lens. And I'm going to run a cut across there at typical cutting speed of maybe 15 millimetres a second. Okay, now I purposely run it off the end there so that we can see what the depth of cut is. I'm going to clean those up shortly and we'll be able to have a look at the depth of cut for each one of these cuts. Well that's rather interesting isn't it? 400, 700, 800, 900 and 1200. The sharpest cut was expected to be at 800 but it's rather interesting that it also produced the shortest depth of cut but slightly off the centre where the beam is slightly wider look we're getting a much deeper cut at these two positions and then we drop off badly at the ends where the beam has really grown in diameter. Now three millimetre birch plywood I've got lots of experience with I know that I can cut this comfortably at 35 millimetres a second on my 70 watt glass tube machine. On the 40 watt glass tube K40 I can cut this at around about 15 millimetres a second. So we'll find out what speed we can cut this at at the centre of the machine at 800 millimetres. Currently I've got it set 15 millimetres a second. Well there's the answer, 15 is okay. Let's go to 20. So it's already matched the 40 watt machine and this is basically 30 watts. And it didn't fall out at 20, it pops straight out. Let's try 25, shall we? 25 has not quite made it. I might be able to push that out. I'm not going to try because that doesn't meet my requirements for cutting. <clears throat> but all the other tests that I've done have really not been cutting tests as such. So this is a cutting test with that very with what I would call an engraving lens. It's a compound lens with a very short focal length. Here's the distance I set between the nozzle and the work. Three millimetres, two millimetres, three, three, three. So for some strange reason that one needed to be adjusted very slightly but hey, it was only a small, it's a one millimetre. The three, the three in the middle here are the high intensity, fairly uniform beam. I was only able to cut this one at 21 millimetres a second. And look at the beam thickness. I tried two, three, four and five, but two was the best that I could get there. So this one, 24, this is what I thought was the most highest intensity beam, but for some reason or other, I got the best results here at 900 millimeters a second, which is a bit strange because the focus of the intensity was at 800. But once you start cutting it seems that the focus intensity has changed to 900 and then finally we get to these outer, outer ones which are very large blunt beams and look the, uh, the cutting drops off 18 and 15. So I don't think there's any doubt that what I started off saying the larger the beam 
the worse the cutting. Now, I tried to judge these on the basis of the fact that they would nearly all come out. So I've looked at the back here and I've tried to keep them more or less the same. Now I've not pushed them out yet, but I think that they will all actually push out quite easily. I didn't really want to push them out, I wanted to keep them in there so that there was a reference. This is quite amazing in the same sort of way because I was only I'm only able to get 35 millimeters a second out of my 70 watt machine. So I'm on the way to discovering how to make this machine into a cutting monster. This is twice as fast as I can cut with the 40 watt glass tube machine. So I'm already doing something significantly different than the glass tube machine, but of course I can't play with the beam on the glass machine. It is what it is, it's fixed, but it's not a bad beam. It's quite a narrow beam. This is really quite interesting, 21 to 27. There are slight differences in the way in which the power is being used by the lens to create cutting. So although I understand how cutting takes place, I still don't understand how the power has to be distributed within the beam to get most efficient cutting. Now you might remember a year ago when I first started trying to find out how lenses cut, I did this to a lens and that completely destroyed the cutting function of a lens. It engraves extremely well, but it does not cut. And that told me something about the sharpness of the beam and the high intensity that goes through the center of the beam, which is very important for cutting. This tells me exactly the same thing because we've got a very small high intensity beam and it's cutting extremely well as I anticipated it might. Now, now I've got to investigate what's happening here at 900 because why have I managed to get such a high cutting power here at 900 and yet down at 700, when we look at the bowed burns, we'll find that 700 and 900 are not far apart. And in fact, if anything, we might see that 700, uh, let's go back and check that again. We're gonna look at several different aspects of this beam. We've seen what its real cutting ability is. Can we see anything about that cutting ability by piercing a block of acrylic? As you all know, I love acrylic and I love burning holes in acrylic because it tells me a great deal. We can't just do this willy nilly. We've got to have some strategy because something is happening which is creating wonderful cutting under certain conditions. And I'm trying to narrow down those conditions to see if I can get this cutting monster. At the moment, we've got a pretty good flying start, but we're only using a very, very short focus length beam. And that's not gonna get us any serious cutting depth. One of the ways I've found of assessing the cutting depth is to see how deep the beam can cut in a practical, period of time. What is a practical period of time? Well, let's try and break it down. If I've got a dot, which is 0.1, it will generate a curve if I draw them in a straight line of 0.1. And that's very, very much the sort of curve width I'm getting with this lens when it's nicely focused. So I've got 10 dots in a millimeter, which is equivalent to a cut that's one millimeter long. So let's assume that we're gonna cut at a fairly slow speed, five millimeters a second, means we're gonna to have to produce 50 dots in a second. And so I'm only gonna be using single pulses and I'm going to see what happens when I produce a dot. And so that dot is gonna be a thousand milliseconds, which is one second, divided by 50 dots per second. So that means every dot is gonna be 20 milliseconds long. I'm trying to find out how quickly this beam will burn into this material. Depending on the beam size, it should technically get deeper for the thinner beam. A 20 millisecond pulse will give me an idea of how fast I should be able to cut. Then we go into the realms of, I don't know what the hell is gonna happen. Because we're gonna burn the same lens, but we're gonna run it for two seconds and see how far it burns through this 25 millimeter block of acrylic. So whether I can draw any conclusions from this, whether it's gonna be useful, is, is gonna be interesting. This is going to be just a straightforward copy of what we've already seen several times before, which is a no lens mode burn. 
at the five points around the machine. So we should see, after we've done the five tests, that these no lens burn profiles roughly match what we did when we set the beam out in a straight line and did our basic beam conditioning tests. We're starting at 400, 700, 800, 900 and 1200 millimetres away from the source. What you can see here is how much damage I can do with that beam in 20 milliseconds. That gives me an idea of the cutting capability at each one of these positions. It's speed of material damage rather than depth of damage which is really important when it comes to determining how well this, how good this lens is at cutting. Now bear in mind that this material here, which is acrylic, is about twice as difficult to cut as wood. So we would expect these results, if we could see them in wood, to be twice as deep as what we see them here. So this should cut three millimeter material. This will cut three millimeter material better. This will cut three millimeter material even better. This one, well, it's about the same as that one, I would think. And then this one, not very good at all. So we might have three millimeters, four or five, five or six, four or five, and back to three millimeters again for our penetration tests. So let's have a look at the shape of our beams now. This is a four second mode burn without the lens in. And this reflects roughly the data that you saw earlier of how I set my beam up when I was busy playing with the beam. This is supposedly the best and the most, most powerful beam. But I think this is interesting. Here at 700, it seems to have pierced through a little bit better. This looks as though the intensity focus is almost at 700 millimeters because I've got a sharper, thinner beam there than I have here at 800 millimeters, which is where I thought my intensity focus was when I set the whole system up. This one, 900 millimeters, not particularly good. And 1200 millimeters, well, this is the serious real definition of a blunt beam. But it's interesting when we look at the, the effect of a blunt beam as opposed to a sharp beam when we come to our penetration test with the lens in. This has got a little bit of bulging on it. Can you see the ballooning on that? This one has got no ballooning on it. This one has got no ballooning on it. This one has got virtually, it's got just a hint of ballooning on it. And this one has got some serious balloons. So we've definitely got a lot of side energy creeping in here, coming through the damage that we're doing at the surface and eating away at the side walls of this bore. I mean, I've, I've still got a huge amount to learn about how the energy distribution in the beam and how it works through the lens really operates. Because this one, you would say, well, that looks fairly similar to this one. This one only produced a 15 millimeter a second cut. And this one produced a 27 millimeter a second cut. And you would think that this one would be much better than that one, but it hasn't, it's only 24. And this one, which is even better than that one, only works at 21. So we need some sort of bulk in the beam, some sort of shape in the beam to catch the, the beams that are off centre from the central axis of the lens, because these, they're not really obviously focusing very much at all. They're, there's some focus taking place, obviously, because we're doing some cutting. But this seems to be a much better, more efficient cutting beam than these two. So fascinating as these results are, the real point of this session was to prove that if you use a blunt beam, which is a big diameter, as you can see here, you get much worse cutting. And here we have the evidence of that. The bigger the beam, the worse the cut. The bigger the beam, the worse the cut. 35 millimeters a second is what I get with my 70 watt tube. And look, we've got 27 millimeters a second here with this 30 watt tube. And this is 
what I would class as an engraving lens. Now we know it's not an entirely an engraving lens because you've seen the cuts. They're very deep V cuts. So this is still a cutting lens, even though it's a very short focus, people would say engraving lens. There's a central power that passes through the lens which makes it into cutting and it produces the deep V that you've seen when we did the line tests. So just for comparison now, what I want to do is to take a look across the centre of the machine here where I thought the most powerful beam was and where I did most of my engraving, remember? Now I know I wasn't using wood for my engraving, but what we want to do is to burn a line across this wood at a thousand millimetres a second. Well, there's my thousand millimetre a second line. I very much doubt whether I shall see any depth in it at all, but I'll go and grind the edge away so it's nice and light and white so we can see what depth we've got. Staggering as it might be, it shows you how much power there is in that beam because even at a thousand millimetres a second, you won't be able to see that there. But I looked at it under the glass and I would say that there's probably a two millimetre deep V in there. This is still a cutting lens. <laughs> Six millimetres out of focus, 98% power. My line has gone wide, but it's not gone dark. I'm still not scorching it. I've actually got so much power there, I'm still actually evaporating a small groove away. I've still got more power there than is required to scorch that material. Let's reduce the power to 50%. We've got control of the line thickness. I mean, the line thickness is going down wonderfully well, but we're not changing the colour. We might be changing the depth slightly. We'll check those out under the microscope. But this just helps to describe what's going on with an RF laser. You haven't got the same sort of intuitive control when you play with the power. Now this is poplar plywood, which is quite soft, but this is a three millimetre surface ply. And you can see we're one and a half millimetres deep at a thousand millimetres a second with a 30 watt beam. The intensity must be absolutely incredible to do that amount of damage. So that, that's what it looks like on the surface. Now those dots in the bottom there are the frequency of the uh, PWM. Um, that's left over from when I was using this for doing the, uh, the Fox at about 800 millimetres a second. So that's about 4K, those dots. And those dots will be about 0.1 diameter. So you can see the kerf is not far off 0.1. Now with a very short focus lens like this on the glass tube machine, if you put it out of focus by three millimetres, you will get a serious change in the colour. Okay, you'll also get a change in the beam width. So let's just see what happens when we put this out by three millimetres. We got a wider beam, but we didn't get any change of colour other than lighter. <laughs> so we didn't get any scorching. So there's our in focus cut and there's our three millimetre out of focus wider cut, but it's a very shallow cut. And then we went plus six millimetres and there's our six millimetre out of focus cut, which because it's only a very shallow cut, that should be very dark because it should be scorching at this point. Well, we've got just the merest hint of coloration in there, as you can see, but it's a very, very wide beam. So let's reduce the power to 50%. Same color, but a narrower beam. So let's reduce the power to 25%. Same colour, but narrower beam. This is supposedly a very short engraving lens where I've shown you it's a cutting lens. How do I get that beam soft enough so that it scorches rather than vaporises the material? Because that's what it's doing at the moment. It's vaporising the surface. It's not scorching it. If it was scorching it, it would be brown. I'm going to leave you with that problem because this is one of the contradictions that happens with an RF laser. This, this session has really nothing to do with RF lasering and, and you know I don't really want you to get heavily involved with it because most people don't have the luxury that I have 
of an RF laser to play with the beam like I'm able to play with the beam. But I'm using this machine as a test bed to experiment with what I've talked about today. There's some strange relationship between the size of the beam and the focal length of lenses where I'm sure that somewhere along the way, whether it be a one and a half or a two inch lens, I'll be able to find a beam size that will make this into a cutting monster for maybe something like maybe half inch thick material. That's my dream. I'm part way along that dream now because I've certainly got close to matching what I can achieve on the 70 watt machine with this machine for thin materials. But hey, thin materials and short focus lenses go together. I've got to go for a longer focal length lens and play with my beam expander. So I've got to find just the right size beam that matches the focal length of the lens. Lots of work still to do. So thanks very much for your time and your patience today. And I hope it's been interesting. See you next time.